be perfectly worded and perfectly crossed. It's like the problem is apologizing. To know that they're supposed to say something in the moment, but it's hard to have the exact right words in that moment at the same time. So it's like we want the speed and we want the wording to be perfectly crafted. I think the good news for companies is that it appears customers like don't care that much in the long run. They like to get upset in the near term, and then we forget pretty quickly. Like all of us feel like I'm never going to ride an Uber again after everything that happens. We all, for the most part, still use Uber, so we just like to get up in arms and get over it pretty fast. Yeah, and given that, how should companies respond to consumer anger, to consumer protests, to consumer boycotts, to consumers threatening of boycotts? That's a really tough managerial issue. Um, the speed versus the absolutely right response is why everybody needs crisis communications in advance of a crisis, right? Because in the middle of a crisis, the last thing you want to be worried about is do we need to be fast or do we need to be right, right? So you're, you're constantly trading that off. So I'm going to ask Ron to, to talk about that. Um, interestingly, Dave Carroll responds to the Dr. David Dow incident. He posts a fourth United Breaks Guitars video. This one is awful. It's not a song. It's just him talking about now he thinks he's like a pundit on airline uh, issues. And it's quite long. It's like six minutes long. It's quite boring. And it gets uh, absolutely no. <laughs> it doesn't go viral uh, at all. Uh, I wish I had time to show you this one. This is a, uh, looks like a high school or college age student who riffs on Dave Carroll's uh, original song and creates a new version <coughs> that he sings to us on YouTube called United Broke His Hip or Lip or His Lip. Uh, and it's about Dr. David Dow to the tune of the original uh, United Breaks Guitars. But I'm going to ask Ron to join us up front here and uh, give you some thoughts on what he's heard and some general uh, thoughts about crisis communications in general. So please welcome him. So I did not fly United up here to get here. Look. <laughs> you know, I think... Um, Brilliant thoughts I've heard here, but the reality is that in crisis, authenticity and really giving a damn matters. The reality is I just think airlines, and I don't work for any big airlines currently, airlines just don't give a damn. <laughs> Fundamentally, the reality is, is that airlines do not give a damn. I think that a millennial survey was BS, fake news. 40% of millennials not flying United. How many choices do you guys have here in Boston to fly the United? You know, in New York, I have four, five, six options to fly somewhere here, you guys probably have two or three. The reality is, as somebody here said, it's about price, and it's about timing when you're flying. But I think you shouldn't confuse this industry that you're talking about here of airlines versus other categories. The reality is, is that airlines have a luxury that many other brands and many other categories, you know, don't have. Can anybody here honestly say that they enjoy the flying experience? You know, my memory of flying, and of course I fly much, much, much too much of business, but those of us who go through the airports, you know, one of your first things is standing like this, right? <laughs> you know, to hold your hands above your head is one of your first actions when you're walking through TSA. You know, the only other way that you might do that is when you're arrested, right? <laughs> From beginning to end, you know, the word hostage, which was used here, I think is really a good word. Um, I think the reality is, is that airlines largely do have us hostage, and they realize that. Anybody remember all those memes which were going around after that David Dow thing? You know, hey, my, you know, hey, my ex-wife is in CXYZ out of this airline United, go get her. <laughs> you know, yet, yet, despite all that, would anybody be shocked today if we turn on our phones and we see United did it yet again? I won't be. And I don't think anybody in this room will be. I think, um, you know, when Dave Carroll's saying... You know, I should have flown with somebody else. Was it really a matter? I'm not sure it really mattered. And I think, you know, one of the things that we deal with in crisis, and I work for, you know, we've worked on some of the highest profile Fortune 100 things you can think about, countless, you know, high level celebrities, is when it's a crisis, is it a cardiac arrest, meaning you're going to die? Is it a broken arm or is it a band aid? In reality, I don't think that this thing, that either of these incidents cost the companies real money. You know, I work for hedge funds and big banks, and they're not going out and saying, wow, this guy got dragged off of a plane. That's not, that's not affecting the fundamentals of a very, very, very large 
billion, multi-billion dollar, you know, industry. It's just not. Um, and the reality is that it probably wouldn't have mattered. And the reality is, is I don't think that either of these incidents really moved the stock market fundamentals in terms of long-term value. I don't think it affects long-term customer purchasing habits. And I think when you look at their responses, you have to remember also as a um, you know, large company, they have multiple audiences. I think um, the CEO's initial response to the doctor's incident was awful. Asterisk, what he's also saying to his employees is stand up against tough, tough, tough customers. You know, this was an awful incident, but remember, they had to fly that plane. So what they said in that response, if you read it carefully, was we're not going to pull customers off of a plane again. What they're not telling you is that means, great, the whole flight's not going to go. Right? They're not going to pull customers off the plane, but they might say, hey, guys, if nobody gets off, guess what? This whole plane isn't going because we don't have safety people on the ground to do this, this, this. And guess what you're going to do about it? Nothing but complain. Asterisk again, don't, don't you know, confuse this industry with other industries. I would tell you one of the fundamental rules in crisis is authenticity and reality. When we work for brands, people, others, it has to sound real. There's very little that an airline can say to a customer to make them feel good. There's very little that an airline can say to a customer to make them you know, feel like it's um, reality. Um, I think there's a lot of things I could talk to you about in crisis. Um, but I would tell you some of the you know fundamental mistakes that I see from you know brands is not responding when they need to respond. I think the reality is in both of these incidents they did need to respond. It got a lot of noise. They had to respond. That doctor video was just awful. I mean, this was a 69-year-old doctor getting dragged off of a plane. This wasn't a criminal. This wasn't someone who did done something wrong. Awful, awful, awful visual. You know, you couldn't have picked a worse you know guy to pull off a plane, right? Maybe it could have been, you know, a kid in her, a kid crying in her mother's arms or something. That was an awful image. They had to respond. Um, you know, those I think in the crowd who said, those I think in the classroom who say that, you know, the brand shouldn't have responded to Dave Carroll. I think they fundamentally set up rules along the way for him not to, for them not to respond, right? How many of us have been screwed by something and don't call again and again and again? This was a guy who kept calling again and again and again and made a video and it happened to catch. They had to respond because it got, you know, so many views. The reality is they didn't get those views and didn't get media coverage. They just wouldn't have responded. Generally, you know, big businesses have a system in terms of, you know, they have prepared language ready to go. We are sorry that this happened because X, Y, Z, and you can fill in. We work for Fortune 100 without, you know, too much fanfare. We have multiple choices. We are sorry this happened because, and we can pick from one of three, you know, canned responses. That's the reality of how these things work, and we hope that they go away. Um, you know, I think in crisis, if you want to think about crisis communications, other things you should know about, what somebody mentioned, timing really matters. There's a reason that big businesses announce firings or terminations or bad news on a Friday afternoon because they know they're going into a slow news cycle. You hope that something bad happens, you know, when something else big happens in the world because it can go away that much quicker. If there's less happening in the news cycle, it's more likely that the news cycle will continue. Um, but I think that more than ever before, citizens slash influencers slash, you know, every man are able to have a voice much more than ever before. Much more than ever before. You, know, you look at people's careers who are changed because of one word that they say. You know, I wouldn't want to be a college student today or, you know, in university today because you say one stupid thing in front of four people and it gets taped, your career is forever changed. Might be true, might not be true. You got to respond really quickly. So I think speed really matters, um, and that's my you know words of wisdom for the men. I'd love to take your questions and thoughts and any of those sorts of things. Ben, yes. And so I've said a question between how do you think about the difference, if any, between managing like a crisis for an individual, like a celebrity that you're talking about, and managing a crisis for a company, and any differences that you see between those two? I think there's you know, there a lot of you know fundamental differences. Um, so we work for both people and for um, we work for both people and for businesses. I would tell you that you know a CEO makes a big mistake and get fired. It can forever affect his business. It can affect, forever affect his reputation. When crisis happens, remember also in the company, there's also there's often a fall guy, and it's very easy to fire the head of operations or the CEO of the company. A lot easier than it is to stop flying, you know, United or XYZ Airlines. Um, you know, I think for people, I think one of the things that you see out there, you know, some of us might have seen that R. Kelly interview the other day, right? R. Kelly is playing to the court of public opinion. 
R. Kelly, ultimately, if he goes before a jury, needs one juror to think that he didn't do what he's accused of doing, right? It's a lot different than the court of law. So in the court of public opinion, you go out there and you try and convince the public of something. You think judges and juries don't read newspapers? Hate to tell you they do. We get hired all the time to hire. Uh, we get hired all the time to, um, you know, influence judges and juries. And it's been reported R. Kelly asked to hire us, and we said no. But... R. Kelly, for example, is looking to play to the court of public opinion, which is a lot different than the court of law. Asterisk, you should all remember, as you know, lawyers always remind me, a bad day in the court of law is a lot different than... A bad day in court is a lot different than a bad day in the newspapers. A bad day in court is a lot different than a bad day in the newspapers. So I think that um, when it comes to people's brands, they have to be very cognizant. Uh, but it's a lot different than big, big, big business. Stock prices are generally, you know, again, I don't think Nike was fundamentally affected by Colin Kaepernick. I do think the Colin Kaepernick was, but brand was fundamentally defined by that kneeling moment. He will forever be defined by that. Nike will not forever be defined by Colin Kaepernick. Who else? Yes, sir. Um, so when you're talking about uh, which industries that consumers have this implied consent that they're okay being treated like cattle, how do you look at that from like when you get hired on, when to listen to consumers and when not? So like for instance, last year we had Ryan Air CEO stand up here and say, I want to start charging for bathrooms because half the people won't use them anymore. I can then charge 5% less. And then all the people that said I wouldn't fly your airline are going to fly my airline because my prices are 5% lower, right? So, like, how do you decide when to listen and when not to listen? Yeah, I think it's a really, really, really tough industry because, again, this industry just doesn't give a damn, A, and B, you have so few options. You don't have other options. Um, how, do you decide when to, how do you decide when to listen? I think when, once the media swell becomes enough that you have to respond, I think it's a question of, it's a lot like the, you know, the triage system. United with Dave Carroll is designed to break you. I think fundamentally, you know, somebody might, again, we don't work for any major airlines right now, but I think that they're designed to break you. I think that when we sit in the rooms with these people that I have, you know, there's six different layers like, you know, this, you know, here they're not being nice, then there they're not being nice, then there, then there. By the time you get up there, you know, by the way, your kids are screaming, you got this going on, you got that going on, you might say, oh, fuck it, I don't need to do it anymore. What am I dealing with this for? Um, I think once it starts making noise out there in the media, and it's affecting search engines, and it's affecting consumer warranty agencies, and things like that. I think, you know, at that point, you have to, um, will be my, you know, thing. But it's a lot different, again, when we talk about Nike and Colin Kaepernick. Nike, for me, is a very smart, educated brand. <coughs> Nike knew what they were getting into, though, with that Colin Kaepernick incident. Anybody disagree with that? Nike's a really bright brand. When they do that, they know that that's how, they know that they're going to get a fundamental pros and cons, like it, don't like it. That's much different than, you know, other instances we talk about here. Who else? So, a woman. Please, let just... um, One of the things that I was struck by in both of these David cases was that United employees weren't really the the ones who are most responsible for the most egregious actions. So the baggage handlers are employed by the airport, is my impression. And also, in the first case, it was the Chicago airport police. How do you handle or think through the difference in crisis management when you're talking about a brand that is fully responsible for the action versus a brand where it's their problem, but it's maybe not their fault? There's no question that somebody sitting in the room of United said, we didn't do it, the cops did it. There's no question, because they really didn't. The reality is they did not pull that guy, or that doctor off. The Chicago police or the Chicago Transit or somebody did. There's no question that somebody said that there. I would ask two questions. Are we going to have problems with the police nationwide, wherever we're going? Are we going to have problems with TSA, wherever we're going? You know, politics goes into a lot of things as well. And you better believe the United States <coughs> to deal every 12 seconds with police unions and cops on the ground and anywhere else that they go to. Obviously, security, TSA, et cetera, et cetera, A. And B, the question is, would you really give a damn? The reality is, is that, you know, United is the big bad wolf. You bought your ticket through United. And the United, uh, you know, flight attendant, whoever it was, you know, called in the... Um, called in the audience. But I would assure you that that was a question in the room. If I was in that room, that question would be raised and we would say, you know, the baggage handlers must have a baggage handler union. You're right. They don't work for United. They work for the XYZ airport. The reality is, is that I'm buying my ticket through United and people are bitching about United. It's, you know, it's shifting the blame in an area that you can't really shift the blame, I think. The well, classic so. example of that, Alexis, is the Tylenol scare <coughs> back in the 80s. So somebody came in and tampered with Tylenol, so it wasn't the company's fault at all, but the company stepped up and took responsibility, apologized, even though they hadn't 
done anything themselves and changed their protocols and safety so that uh, they could reassure the public because they said someone did this to our brand, but it's still our brand, and so we need to take responsibility. Yes. Yeah, um, we talked a lot about kind of how the rules have changed in the social media age and in this sort of era of virality. I'd love to hear how you think about responding <coughs> using some of those tools as a PR response rather than um, kind of the recipient of the reaction from that. Well, I think the reality is with, with digital media today, media is going to become less and less and less important, right? In other words, if I'm united and I wanted to give a response, you know, as you saw there, the response on Twitter, they can give a response on social media, you know, like them or don't like them. One of the reasons President Trump is the president is because of social media. It's because he's showing us that you don't need to use traditional media the same way. Um, I think that with, you know, virality, you know, you could argue that Kim Kardashian, a, an endorsement from Kim Kardashian and an IG post for an Instagram post from Kim Kardashian is as powerful as a Super Bowl ad. I think that that's not going away at all. I think that brands that know how to identify and correspond and build Brand loyalty goes a long way with um, consumers in any industry, I think. Well, yes, sir, in front. Um, what are your thoughts about managing a specific brand versus an entire category? Um, I guess for this airline industry, if something bad happens to one brand, there's a huge contagion effect to the entire industry. And so, was this like an opportunity for American adults to proactively come out and manage their relations with their customers? I think, again, in this, you know, if, if we believe that American and Delta really cared about their customers any more than, you know, United, perhaps, I think the reality is, you know, JetBlue, I think, if you look at, there was a JetBlue incident a few years ago when JetBlue was ground, we got a lot of press, JetBlue was forced to stay on the ground at, you know, LaGuardia, I think, for 14 hours or 16 hours or something else. The next day, the CEO himself insisted on going on the Today Show on Good Morning America at every station in the world and saying, basically, we apologize, we are sorry, and here is what is going to absolutely change. He introduced the JetBlue, I think, uh, Passengers Bill of Rights. You know, they were very adamantly about talking about how they really give a damn about their customers, how they like their customers, and it was authentic and it was real, and it made sense. And by the way, those of you who fly JetBlue, you feel it. You feel the difference. They're proud of giving you more legroom. They're proud of giving you extra snacks and not charging you for it and things like that. I think that is a case where, you know, you can take advantage of it and where it does make sense. Again, though, it's got to be about authenticity. I think it works for JetBlue because when you fly JetBlue and you experience JetBlue, you feel the difference. I think it wouldn't work if I were Delta or American because they're just as bad. Um, you know, it happens that Delta probably had these two incidences. I don't think that, you know, the other airlines are much better or give it that much more. Well, yes. As a culture, I think we romanticize um, crisis management, like the show scandal, et cetera. What does it look like? Love her. <laughs> what does it look like boots on the ground, like post an event, just like talking through, uh, assuming they've done the pre-work, like what does that look like for you and your team? I do a lot of, I do a lot of crisis work. So one of the things I'll tell you is, um, you know, I initially wanted to work in politics. I worked in politics for a few years. It's really an awful life working in politics. <laughs> awful life. So those of you who think, you know, thankfully my 13-year-old daughter, I dragged up here to her up here to Harvard Business School to be with me today. But the reality is, is that working in politics, you don't have a life. Because every single day, every single day you have a crisis, every single day you have a problem, every single day. So you can't have a normal life. So those of you who want to do that, crisis PR is a little bit different, but you have a problem every 12 seconds. And I tell everybody, nobody gives a damn that it's your kid's birthday. Nobody gives a damn that you were booked on vacation. Nobody gives a damn that this is happening or that's happening. That's the reality of working in crisis PR. Um, I think um, Scandal happens to be pretty realistic. I think there's a new show now, Flack. If you haven't heard of it, it's awful and not real at all. Um, and I think the, the, the romance is, I think PR is a mix of being a psychologist and being a lawyer. It's a mix of a bunch of different things. I've sat with um, a Fortune 50 CEO. Something huge happened. I think the guy went into shock. He just didn't realize what was going on. It's some, uh, something you've all heard of. Um, the reality of working in crisis PR is it, work, is it moves very quick. Um, you never know when it's going to happen. And you never know when it's going to really become humongous. There's things that happened that I was convinced would become huge, huge, huge stories. And they went away in 12 seconds and we got lucky because of something else in the news cycle or something else. There's other times that things would have happened and you'd never guess it. I wouldn't have bet on that Dave Carroll incident, for example, becoming big. He was a nobody. The song was okay. I wouldn't have bet that that would become big. Um, 
So I think, um, you know, crisis PR, it's a lot like being a lawyer. A lot better. I think a lot more fun if you have the stomach for it. It's a lot more fun. Uh, in the back. For example, for the Dave Carroll video, so that was a fairly one-off minor incident, uh, but got a lot of views, so you have to address it. In that situation, are you better off acknowledging and accepting full blame, or does that actually turn it into a bigger story and into a crisis? Now, somebody mentioned earlier, I think there's a problem of, you know, discriminate, I don't want to use the word discriminate, but I think there's a problem of saying, I screwed this guy, he's going to get $3,000. But the problem is that every other, you're going to get your phone ringing off the hook with people saying, well, you gave Joe $5,000, why won't you give Jill $5,000? It's a big problem. And somebody mentioned that, you know, I don't use the word discrimination, whatever that word is, it's very hard when you're dealing with that many customers to deal with that kind of thing. I think the thing that United should have said if I was representing them was, the 99.95% comment was a very good comment. 99.95% of people that we deal with get it right. When we don't, we apologize and we're going to do everything we can to make it right. I don't think they needed to say much more than that. I thought the response, nobody caught it, but the response, which I hated in the United case study, was the BFF. Didn't we see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dave Carroll is now my BFF. I hate that. Somebody should have fired for that one. <laughs> Dave Carroll, now Dave Carroll still hates your guts, and guess what? Dave Carroll still rightfully hates your guts. But guess what? Dave Carroll's still going to fly United. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I think that... Um, that's it, I think the time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs>